Hey everybody, welcome back to Environmental Organic Chemistry. This is the module on partitioning, and so uh, we're going to talk first here a little bit about gas particle partitioning, uh, because it's important in terms of what happens in the environment, and then later on, so gas particle partitioning is two phases, gases and particles. Uh, later on we'll talk about three phase partitioning, which gets really fun. Uh, gas particle partitioning is really important because it determines how long chemicals will stay in the atmosphere. And the longer they stay in the atmosphere, the further they can travel, right? So I, I apologize for the crappy uh, quality of the slide, but this is your residence time in seconds, and this is your transport distance, and you can see that there's generally, you know, this upward trend. If you spend more time in the atmosphere, then you, you will be transported uh, further distances. So here, where, where we have large particles, they will persist maybe for an hour in the atmosphere, and that's gonna mean that they are only transported locally. So this is like when you have construction sites and they're putting out huge amounts of dust, for example. That's not gonna travel very far. Uh, if you stick in the atmosphere for more like a day or several days, then you have regional transport. So uh, in, the, in New Jersey, we have a problem with ozone in part because of regional transport of the precursor gases like NO and NO2 from places like Ohio, where they used to burn a lot of coal for power generation. Um, did you know that under Trump, coal use in the United States is down 30%? 30% under Trump, uh, because it's just not economical anymore. Uh, people are getting away from it. So these are coarse particles. They travel on a regional basis. So again, you know, maybe from Ohio to New Jersey, uh, but to travel on a continental uh, time scale or, or spatial scale, you need to have much finer particles that stick in the atmosphere for many days, maybe even up to a year. Those fine particles can, be travel, can travel very long distances, especially if you get above the atmospheric boundary layer. So these are things that can travel, say, for example, some things are, are emitted in places like China and can actually travel across the Pacific and end up in places like Washington State and Oregon. Um, so those are very fine particles. And then on a global scale, things that get transported globally are things that stay in the atmosphere for a long time. And that includes, unfortunately, our friends carbon dioxide and methane, which are, you know, potent greenhouse gases. So they stay in the atmosphere for a very long time. And as a result, they get mixed globally. The concentrations are fairly steady on a global basis. So how do particles get removed from the atmosphere? Well, one uh, mechanism is that they get washed out by the rain. And we have a scavenging coefficient here that we call W sub T. Uh, and it's just the concentration of the chemical in the rain divided by the concentration in the air. And we are not making any distinction here between whether the chemical is in the gas phase, the particles in the air, the dissolved phase, or the particles in the water. It's just total, total amount of chemical in the air and in the water. Uh, but we could divide that up into a scavenging coefficient for the particles. That's where the P comes from here and a scavenging coefficient for the gas phase, that's the G. And phi here is the fraction of the chemical that's in the particle phase. So the WP is multiplied by phi, WG is multiplied by one minus phi, because that would be the, the amount of the chemical that's in the gas phase. So the, the point being that rain captures both particles. It's actually very effective at stripping particles out of the atmosphere. That's why the air is so nice and clean after a good heavy rainfall. So it strips them out of the atmosphere, and then there's also a Henry's Law type equilibrium between the gas phase and the uh, raindrops. Snowdrops also do, or snowflakes, do a really good job of stripping stuff out of the atmosphere too. Um, and so it turns out that for particles, when they are captured by a raindrop or a snowflake, it's pretty much an irreversible process. It's, all a, it's one direction. It's the Roche Motel. You check in, you don't check out. But the gases actually equilibrate, which means that it's reversible. They can go either way. So the types of scavenging coefficients we tend to see, the WG is going to depend totally on the Henry's Law constant. If you think about it for a moment, this is C in the water phase divided by C in the air phase. Uh, which is kind of like the inverse of Henry's Law. Henry's Law would be concentration of the gas phase divided by concentration of the aqueous phase. So these WG, these scavenging coefficients for the gas phase, are basically the inverse of Henry's Law. Henry's Law for things like PCBs is about 0.01. So take the inverse of that and you get scavenging coefficients around 200 to 400. Uh, for PAH is a little bit lower because they have higher Henry's Law constants, so a little bit lower WG. And then for scavenging of particles, they're around 10 to the fifth for both PCBs and PAHs. If you think about it, there's, they really ought to have the same scavenging coefficient because it's just particles. 
It's whether or not the particle is being scavenged, not whether or not the things on the particle are being scavenged. Of course they are, because they're on the particle. It's just a question of whether the particle is being scavenged by the raindrop or not. Um, so there's, there's reactions that can happen in the gas phase, or in, in the atmosphere, I should say, and most of those reactions will happen in the gas phase, right? So, um, and we're going to talk about this more when we get to the, all the lectures on photolysis, but most organic chemicals can undergo some kind of reactions in the gas phase, either direct or indirect photolysis. Uh, and so that gives rise to half-lives for these gas phase reactions on the, on the scale of minutes to hours. For PCBs, it uh, could be a couple of days, two, three, four, five days. Uh, in the particle phase, though, because you don't have these types of reactions, the particle phase, the chemical will per persist on the particle for a little bit longer, but, of course, the particle is also falling out of the air. So there's, there's two ways, you know, that you could remove chemicals from the atmosphere. One is reactions in the gas phase, the other is scavenging with particles. And so d understanding how much of the chemical is on the particle versus how much is in the gas phase is really important to understanding its fate in the atmosphere. Uh, uh, and uh, also gas particle partitioning is really important because it has to do with uh, a lot of human health impacts, uh, particles deposit in the lungs. So I have asthma and when I take, I have a little thing called a discus that um, what you do is you like pull the lever and it pops open a little capsule and the capsule has a fine powder in it and then I inhale it and it gets into my lungs and the fine particles get deep into your lungs and then you don't exhale them. So it's a very efficient way of delivering that medicine deep into my lungs. Large particles would just stick in the back of my throat, but the small particles will get all the way down into the lower reaches of my lungs. So they very carefully control the size of the particles in these things. Um, so, you know, this you can use that in medicine, but it's also just true, you know, sort of environmentally, that PM10, which is, you know, the larger particles will, will catch in your throat and in your nasal passages, whereas something small like PM2.5 will get um, inhaled deep into your lung. And so it has, it, it determines the delivery of not just pharmaceuticals, but also environmental contaminants. Uh, by the way, smoke, if you smoke cigarettes or other things, um, smoke works on a very similar basis. Some of it is caught in the back of your throat, but a lot of it gets inhaled very deeply into your body. It's, it's, that's how you deliver nicotine. Nicotine is not a very volatile chemical. So a lot of it gets to, um, to, um, delivered to your lungs by means of particles. We don't really know much about the chemical makeup of the particles and, and how that plays into the, the um, exposure to chemicals. It's a big field of research. Okay, so background. Um, you, as you, I think this is kind of a no-brainer. As you would imagine, the parameters that affect gas particle partitioning include the, the physical and chemical properties of the chemical, right? Their liquid vapor pressure and their KOA, their octanol air partition coefficient, are the two um, measurements, the two parameters that we use to, to understand gas particle partitioning. But it also depends on the particle characteristics, their size distribution, how big are they, how much carbon do they have, are they made of organic carbon or soot carbon, or are they mostly water, you know, what are they made of, and then other things like the atmospheric conditions like temperature and relative humidity. Those are also important in understanding gas particle partitioning. How do we measure gas particle partitioning? Well, there's a lot of different ways. Um, here's one of them. This thing here is called a high volume air sampler or a high vol. And it's hard to see, but right here is the filter. Okay, and then down here is a vacuum pump. So the vacuum pump is sucking air down through the filter and then out the other end, right? And if you're doing this, if you're really being good, you would put an exhaust pipe on here to pipe the exhaust far away from the instrument so you don't inadvertently just suck in your exhaust. Um, but so, so the uh, vacuum pump is pulling the air first across a filter that will uh, capture the particles and then through this thing. This, this is one way of doing it. There's a couple different ways of doing this, but this is what's called um, an absorbent trap thing. It's, it's a packed in a glass sleeve. This is one where they have polyurethane foam at the top and the bottom. This is the same foam that you sit on. Uh, your mattress might be made of it. And then in the middle, they have XAD, which is a different kind of resin. So the air gets sucked through here and it captures the gas phase contaminants or chemicals on the polyurethane foam and on the, the uh, XAD. And then uh, frequently the bottom puff here, you analyze it 
uh, with the hope that you will find no chemical on it, that all of the chemicals got absorbed before they ever hit the bottom puff. If you find a um, chemical in the bottom puff, it means that you have what's called breakthrough. It means that your chemical has migrated all the way through and some of it has broke through and come off the other end. So you're not capturing the full amount of the chemical that was in the, in the atmosphere. And this is just a cartoon. Uh, you know, so first the particles are caught on the filter and then the gas phase goes through that absorbent trap. So the filters could be made of glass, glass fiber filters, GFFs or quartz fiber filters, QFFs. They could be made of Teflon. There's a lot of choices here. The adsorbents, again, could be things like polyurethane foam, poly polymer resins, 10X. There's, there's a lots of choices here. But anyway, that's one way of doing gas particle partitioning. You're getting a measurement of the chemical on the particle phase and a measurement of the chemical in the gas phase. And then your gas particle partitioning is just calculated from there. Um, so this works well for semi-volatile chemicals. That includes things like PCBs, PAHs, dioxins, lots of those kinds of things. But if you have stuff <clears throat> that has uh, lower molecular weight and is therefore more, more volatile, has a higher vapor pressure, <clears throat> the, 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 the high vol doesn't work well because if things with a high vapor pressure won't get caught here on the filter and they also don't tend to stick to the puff very well, they just break through. So for, for things that are relatively volatile, we frequently use what's called a denuder. Here's the cartoon. Uh, so you have these parallel plates and you have, you're sucking air down, you know, again, using a vacuum pump, you're sucking air down through the bottom of this. And uh, large particles have a lot of inertia. And so they will just go straight with the flow lines. They will just follow the laminar flow lines and hit the filter. But gases, which are shown by the smaller dots here, they can diffuse uh, horizontally a lot more. And so they will diffuse onto the plates of the denuder and stick to them. So the hope is that you remove pretty much all the gas phase stuff before you ever get down here to the absorbent trap. Hopefully the absorbent trap has like nothing on it. But there's, here's a couple of pictures of what some of these denuders look like. They can be made of glass. They can be made of lots of other things. And again, you're sucking the air through them and then the gas phase compounds have a chance to stay on the, the walls. So this is th good for things uh, for gases like NOx that have high concentrations and, and low, uh, low molecular weight and therefore higher vapor pressures. But again, uh, you have, you're getting a measurement of how much of the thing is in the filter and how much of the thing is in the gas phase. And you just divide one by the other to get the gas particle partitioning. Uh, and then sometimes, and by the way, if you want to learn more about this, you should take Dr. Manelis's air sampling class. We also um, sometimes use something called a Moody, the Moody, which stands for micro orifice uniform deposit impactor. And the Moody, uh, again, you're using a vacuum pump to pull air down through here. And the Moody has different, what are called stages. You can see them stacked up here. Each of these stacks is a different stage. And you can kind of see here, like this has got a wide aperture, but as you go further down, these apertures get a little bit narrower, right? And so you're sucking the air through at a constant flow rate. So where you have a large aperture, you have a relatively flow rate, relatively slow flow rate. And then as the aperture gets smaller, the flow rate gets faster and faster. And again, it's operating on a similar principle to the Moody where um, large particles have a lot of inertia. So they will just flow and just boom, hit the impactor plate. But smaller particles will stay in the laminar flow and flow around it. And then as the, as the um, flow rate gets faster because the aperture is getting smaller, you get smaller and smaller fractions of the particles impacting on the plate. So each of these Moody stages is designed to capture a different size particle fraction. And uh, it depends on the specific Moody, but the ones that I've used have something like eight to 10 stages uh, with different cutoffs. And then in the very bottom, there's a filter that captures whatever's left of the particles. So this is great. Uh, it allows you to look at the distribution of your chemical across different particle size fractions. The problem is that um, if frequently the concentrations on the particles are low to begin with. And then when you divide that signal up into eight to 10 different fractions or different stages, you, you're lowering your, your uh, or raising your detection limit by about an order of magnitude. And sometimes you have problems being able to detect anything. Uh, and then uh, the, the final type of sampler is called a cyclone sampler. Uh, so the idea here, again, you're, you're sucking air, in this case, out through the top. You have a filter here. Um, and you're sucking the air in, and it's, it's, it's kind of looks like a cylinder. We we're looking at a, a slice of it, but it's a cylinder. And so that forces the air to then rotate around in a cyclone fashion. 
and then come back up the top. Uh, and the geometry and the flow rate and everything determines how big the particles have to be before they will impact on the side. So if you get the geometry and everything just right, anything larger than 2.5 microns will impact on the side, and the smaller particles, the PM 2.5, will go out the top and get captured on the filter, the filter right there. So, yeah. So those are the different types of filter of uh, sampling schemes, and they all have their problems. Uh, you know, if you're using a filter, there's always the chance that gas phase contaminants will absorb onto the filter. Or as those gas phase contaminants cross the filter, the filter accumulates particles and the, those gas phase contaminants might then stick to particles that are just sitting there on the filter. Uh, and the, the stuff could also volatilize off the filter, especially, you know, if you're sucking a really fast flow rate across that filter, you're, you're creating a pressure drop that's basically sucking the contaminants off the filter, off the particles, um, especially at high temperatures and high flows, large pressure drops. And so there's all kinds of problems uh, to, to accurately measure gas particle partitioning, but you know, at least in theory, can be done. Uh, and so those are some of the techniques. And in the next lecture, we'll talk more about the theory of how this all works.